Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Joseph Cotton and Ida Lupino in The Seventh Veil. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Living as we do in an age of science, it's fair to ask how far science can go in unraveling the mysteries of the human mind and probing the often troubled secrets of the heart. We have an answer in tonight's compelling drama from J. Arthur Rank's production of The Seventh Veil, a story of tempestuous love and the shadow of a strange neurosis. And our stars are two of Hollywood's finest, the ever-popular Joseph Cotton and that lovely dramatic actress, Ida Lupino. Our play unfolds in London, where you may be surprised to know there are many fans of the Lux Radio Theater who have heard it broadcast to our men and women overseas by short wave, and many fans of Lux Soap, too. One of our American listeners forwards us a letter from a relative in England thanking her for presents she sent. I was particularly grateful, says the letter, for the Lux Soap you included. Soap is still scarce here, and to have my favorite Lux is really luxury. Well, while Lux Toilet Soap is not a luxury in this country, I know that the women in our audience agree with the sentiments expressed by our friend in England. On to our play and Act One of The Seventh Veil, starring Joseph Cotton as Nicholas Brandt and Ida Lupino as Francesca Cunningham. The Kendall Sanitarium, London. In his office, Dr. Kendall is discussing a patient with an eminent psychiatrist, Dr. Albert Larson. Well, Dr. Larson, now that you've seen Miss Cunningham... You said she was admitted here following an automobile accident. Yes, her injuries were not serious, as you undoubtedly observed. Yesterday evening, she got out of bed, slipped away from here, and attempted suicide by jumping off a bridge. Why? I wish I knew... Miss Cunningham hasn't spoken in days. It's as if she couldn't hear, but we know she can hear. That's only one of several indications that she needs you rather than a medical doctor. Miss Cunningham will talk, Dr. Kendall. I've given her an injection to produce a mild narcosis, enough to induce a light slumber. Well, I, uh, I'd hoped we could avoid that. Oh, the drug is harmless, but it will make her talk. Of course, still... Uh, if you'll forgive me, it, uh, it savors a little of prying. Well, definitely it is prying. Dr. Kendall, a surgeon doesn't operate without first removing the patient's clothes. Nor do we with the mind. The mind is like Sallow Maid, the beginning of her dance. She conceals herself beneath seven veils. People, too, have veils. Veils of reserve, shyness, fear, shame. Some they can be persuaded to cast off. But the seventh veil... Shields the innermost secrets of the mind. Very rarely is that voluntarily removed. That's why I say narcosis. With it, we can really be of help. Oh, I think our patient is ready for us, Doctor. The drug seems to have taken effect. Yes, but she can hear me perfectly. This is Dr. Larson, Miss Cunningham. I'm so happy you've been able to, to sleep. How wonderful it is to relax, to rest. You do hear me, don't you? Nod your head, Miss Cunningham, then I'll know for sure. Ah, uh -huh. thank you. Now, you can do whatever you please. What would you like to do? Would you like to go back to school? You were happy when you were a little girl, weren't you? Wouldn't you like to be happy again? Back to school? Back to school? School. Tell me about school. You are 14 years of age now. How old are you? I'm... I'm 14. Uh, what's going on at school today? Tell me, Francesca. We... Oh, we've been fishing for minnows before chapel. Susan and I. Fishing for minnows? Yes, that's great fun. But we... We're going to be late for chapel. And I must get back to school. 
Your hurry, Francesca. Oh, please, Susan, we'll be terribly late. Well, what if we are? All we'll get is a black mark. But I've been late once this week already. Miss Lawson's sure to send me to Miss Duncan. Oh, tell her you were sick or something. Oh, she'll never believe me. I said that on Tuesday. Oh, poo. Then tell her you lost your way. I, I hadn't wanted to fish for minnows. But Susan could persuade me to do anything. And I'd always get caught and get punished. In Miss Duncan's office, Willow cane hung on the wall. Well, don't stand there, Cunningham. Hand me the cane. Yes, Miss Duncan. Hold out your hands. Oh, please, Miss Duncan. I know I must be punished, but not my hands. Please, today's the music scholarship for piano. And if you... Oh, oh please, please, my hands. My hands. By afternoon, my hands were still swollen and raw. I played so badly I hadn't a chance. And I'd set my heart on that scholarship. Music. Music was the only thing I really cared for. Even then. But next time you sat for it, you passed easily? No. I never sat for it again. That year my father died. I went to live with my uncle, Nicholas Brandt. It wasn't really my uncle. He... My father's second cousin. He was rich. The only relative I had in the world. He was slightly lame. And he walked with a cane. Well, let's have a look at you. Francesca, isn't it? Yes, Uncle Nicholas. Don't call me Uncle. I'm not your uncle. If you must call me anything, call me Nicholas. Look at me when I'm speaking. Yes, sir. Now listen to me carefully. This is my home. It's a bachelor's establishment. You know what that means? It means that you're, you're not married. It also means that when I came here, I promised myself no woman would ever enter it. So far, none ever has. You're the first. Yes, I, I see. What do you see? That I'm to do my best not, not to intrude upon your privacy. Parker. Yes, sir? Take her upstairs. You know where to put her. Yes, sir. This way, miss, please. Parker? Whose portrait is that on the wall? Mr. Brent's mother. Is she dead? I don't believe so. Well, what happened to her? I can't tell you, miss. Then I shall ask him. I wouldn't if I were you. Why not, Parker? Because if you must know, she left his father, ran off with another man. <gasps> oh, I, I don't believe There it. was a divorce and Mr. Brand had to give evidence. He was only 12 years old at the time. Oh, how dreadful. Yes, miss. You will find my master is a strange, dark man, but not unkind. No, in his way, not unkind. Those, those first few months were the loneliest I ever spent. The whole house seemed to resent my presence. Nicholas, Nicholas would limp about, leaning on his cane, looking right through me as though I weren't there. Well, sometimes he'd send for This letter, Francesca, is from that school you attended from... But Miss Duncan. Oh. Do you know what she has to say about you? Perhaps you opened this letter yourself. Oh, no. No, I... No, I didn't. Then let me tell you. She says your intelligence is above average. Do you agree? I... I don't know. She goes into some length about your shyness. Are you shy of me? A little. Why? I won't eat you. I know, but... but what? I... Nothing. Huh. Francesca has an extraordinary talent for music. She plays the piano extremely well. Has an appreciation of music far beyond her years. Why haven't you told me? I didn't think it would interest you. Indeed. Well, there's a piano. Sit down. Play something. I can't. Why not? Please don't ask me to. I can't. Play something. I can't. I, I won't. Oh, very well. I'll play for you. I wanted to see much to play. And then, suddenly, I, I seemed to lose my fear of him. And I, I sat down beside him, started to play. And as I played, I, I thought I saw Nicholas smile. 
And he walked from the room and I could hear the tap of his cane even above the music. Listening to everything I did. Month after month, he hammered at me. He was a slave driver, but a wonderful teacher. He knew how to get the best out of me. And he knew the spirit of music more than anyone I'd ever met. For two years, he taught me. Then one night I was in. All right, all right, all right, Francesca. That's enough. Yes, Nicholas. It's time you had some proper training. I've arranged for you to start at the Royal College of Music. Oh, oh, Nicholas. You'll report at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. I've arranged for you. Oh. What do you think you're doing? Don't ever do that again. What had you done, Francesca? What made him so angry? <laughs> I was so grateful. I put my arms around him. Dr. Larson, why am I telling you this? Because you feel better having said it. Yes. Oh, yes. You went to the college the next morning? But even before I left the house, Nicholas had gone. Parker said it was a business trip. Be away for months. And then I, I was too busy at college to worry about him. And I, I met Peter. Who is Peter? Where did you meet him? At a little Italian cafe where most of us went for lunch. I just finished eating when I, I felt someone staring at me. You know, you're working much too hard. But I, I like work. <laughs> well, I like ravioli, but I don't eat it all the time. Now, come on, put away that book. I'll pay your bill and we'll go for a walk. Oh, no. No, thanks. Come on, I... come on, come on. Peter. Peter was like that. He, he was an American working his way through college by playing with a dance band at night. The next evening, he took me to the nightclub. I, I, I sat at a table, and whenever he could get away, he'd come over to me. You know, Francesca, there's practically nothing wrong with you. Well, thank you. Oh, you're a bit of a prig, but of course that's just the way you've been brought up. And you're extremely rude. I suppose that's the way you've been brought up. <laughs> I was dragged up. I know it. <laughs> I, I think I'd better go, Peter. I, I can get a cab. You always run away? Well, it's late, and I have some very important things to do. Now, how often do you take the evening off and go to the movies? Never. I don't like oh, films. Oh, but you're sure they take you out of yourself. Now, for instance, a movie about a poor, struggling musician. That's me. He meets a rich girl, Snooty. That's you. You know what happens? No. What? Well, she's cold, unattainable... But underneath it all, she's really falling for it. You see? No. No. Oh, well, that's because you'll never go to the movies. Now, you know what happens next? No. Well, he just leans forward and kisses her. Why did you do that? You know what she does? She walks right out of the place, leaving him looking like a dummy. Well, that's exactly oh, but what that's I... only in the movies. Now, in real life, it's different. He just leans forward and kisses you like... like this. Do you know what you do? I, I certainly do. Good night. But you saw Peter again, Francesca? Oh, yes. Yes, I kept away from him for a week. Then in the same little Italian cafe. You know, this happens in the movies, too. Peter. After the rich girl walks out on the poor musician, they're both awfully unhappy. And after a few days, they both take to haunting the spot where they first met. Oh? Why? Well, because by now they're getting pretty hungry. <laughs> hey, Mariani, two raviolis. But, Peter, I'm not hungry. The raviolis are for me. Don't you realize I've been so miserable I haven't eaten for days? <laughs> oh, I wish I could be angry with you, Peter. I wish I could. Francesca, you can smile. Oh, and it's a beautiful... We saw a great deal of each other. 
He, he took me to so many wonderful places. I, I forgot about Nicholas. He was still away. I, I wasn't prepared for his sudden return home. Good evening, Francesca. Oh, who, oh, Nicholas? Why should you be surprised to see me? Well, I, I just didn't know you were back. Parker says you dined out this evening. Yes, I, yes, I did. Perhaps if you stayed home more often, you'd have better color. You look pale. Been working too hard. No, I don't think so. Well, aren't you going to play for me? Yes, of course, if you'd like. Are you mad? Stop it. But, but you asked me to play. I asked you to play. If you can't think of anything better, play a chromatic scale. Only spare me that shop girl trash. Yes, Nicholas. in the park, Francesca? What's the matter? Oh, nothing. Peter, do you know why I broke our date yesterday? Uncle Nicholas again? No. No, I went to the movies. Who with? By myself. Oh. Yes, it, it was very interesting, Peter. All about a girl who knew that a boy loved her, but hadn't the courage to ask her to marry him. So, so she decided that... Peter, are you listening? Oh, uh, yeah, sure, I'm listening. Well, she decided she'd have to ask him herself. And did she? No. At the last minute, her courage failed her. Peter? Hmm? My courage hasn't failed me. Peter, I want you to marry me. Francesca. Well, well what do you know? You married him, Francesca? That... That night, Dr. Larson, as I waited for Nicholas to come home, I, I told myself there's nothing to be frightened of. He can't do anything. And then I, I heard the click of the latch, tapping of his cane. Still up rather late? Nicholas, I, I must talk to you. Can't wait till morning? But it's very important. Well? Well, I, I don't know how to start Nicholas, I'm engaged to be married. Oh. Well, good night, Francesca. Did you hear what I said? Perfectly. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll look at my mail. But don't you understand, Nicholas? I found a man I love, and I'm going to marry him. Go to bed. Wait. Pack your bags. We're leaving for Paris in the morning. Paris? Oh, but I can't go. I won't. What could I do in Paris? Carry on with your studies. I don't care whether I ever play again or not. Do you hear me, Nicholas? I won't ever play again. Oh, why can't you be nice to me? Why must you always treat me as though I were a child? Because you are. I'm not. I'm grown up. I know what I want, and you're just trying to take it away from me. Don't you understand? I'm in love. How old are you? I won't go. I tell you, I won't. I won't. I won't. I won't. And how old are you? Tell you at 21, I'm your legal guardian. Do you understand what that means? No. It means that you can't marry without my consent. You can't leave this house without my consent. If you do, I can have you brought back by the police now. Now, stop crying. It's my duty to see that you behave properly and don't make a fool of yourself. Is that clear? I... I... Is that clear? Yeah. Then go upstairs. In just a moment, our stars will return in Act Two of The Seventh Veil. Vale. Meanwhile, here's our Hollywood reporter, Libby Collins. There are times, Mr. Keeley, when it seems quite restful to be a reporter instead of a screen star. What do you mean, Libby? Well, recently I watched Paulette Goddard making her new Paramount picture on Concord. She plays the part of an English convict who was sold as a slave in the American colonies. And my, what she goes through. She does indeed. There's a picture crammed with action in true Cecil B. DeMille style. 
That scene where the Indians attack Fort Pitt is one of the greatest fight spectacles ever filmed. And Paulette as the heroine is right in the thick of it. <laughs> it was all worthwhile, though. Because in spite of everything, she gets her man. Yes, and because he's none other than handsome Gary Cooper. Which reminds me, there are some thrilling love scenes in Unconquered. Mm, with such a dashing hero and such a beautiful heroine, how could it be otherwise? Yes, because Paulette in Technicolor is really ravishing to see. John Kennedy should have some thoughts about that. Indeed, I have. Who could resist those brilliant blue eyes and that gorgeous coloring? Well, you mean that lovely luxe complexion, of course. Why, everyone knows that Paulette is famous for her beautiful complexion. She's been a luxe girl for years. I know she has. There's always a supply of luxe toilet soap in her dressing room, at home and in the studio. Active lather facials are a daily care she depends on. Won't you tell the ladies in our audience how Paulette Goddard takes her luxe soap beauty facials? Well, here's what she does. Just smooths the creamy, fragrant lather well into her skin. Rinses with warm, then cold water, and pats with a soft towel to dry. Gives skin fresh, new loveliness, she says. Recent tests by skin specialists prove that. In three out of four cases, complexions improved in a short time. And screen stars recommend Lux Toilet Soap for a delightful beauty bath, too. Try it. You'll enjoy the refreshing lather, the delicate fragrance it leaves on your skin. Here's Mr. Keeley at the microphone. We continue with The Seventh Veil, starring Joseph Cotton as Nicholas Brandt and Ida Lupino as Francesca. Twenty-four hours ago... Francesca Cunningham attempted to take her own life. Now, under the influence of a drug, she continues to bear the secrets of her much-troubled mind. So, Nicholas took you to Paris? Yes. Yes, Dr. Larson. Seven years before I saw Peter again. Seven years of music. Paris, Vienna, Rome... Seven years of Nicholas planning my life, turning me into his dream of a concert pianist. Wherever we went, we were always alone. When I longed for some sort of diversion... Of course, you can't play tennis with a drew in your hands. It was always reminding me, my hands... You are not careful enough, Francesca. Just remember, your hands are your only real asset. My hands. Never risk calming them. Take care of your hands. My hands. Take care of your hands. Your hands. At last, Nicholas decided I was ready for my first concert. It was in Venice. He bought me the gown I was to wear. I had a maid for me. And now he was teaching me how to bow. No, 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 Francesca. Spread your skirt. Let the knee drop right down there. Now try it again. For And for heaven's sake, smile. Yes, Nicholas. Turn around. Let me... Anna. Yes, sir. Look at the way that hem is hanging. Fix it. I'll be waiting at... How dare you burst into this dressing room. Oh, nonsense. I don't know who you are, but I happen to be an old friend of Miss Cunningham. Francesca. Why, Susan. Susan Brooks. My dear, how clever of you to remember me after all these years. Only it's not Brooks anymore. It's Krabatowicz. Horrid name, isn't it, darling? I'm married. Oh, oh Susan. Oh, excuse me. Mr. Nicholas Bryant... Mrs. Uh, Krabatowicz. Mm. Francesca and I were at school together, you know. Twenty minutes, Miss Cunningham is giving a concert. Darling, imagine you a concert pianist. I saw your name on the billboards and I said to my husband, he's my second, I said, why, I was at school with that girl and I told him that screamingly funny story about how you failed to get the scholarship, remember? We were out catching frogs or butterflies or something and came back late for chapel. Of course, it was all my fault, but Duncan insisted on caning your hands most frightfully. Imagine you failing to play the piano well enough. <laughs> Well... What's the matter, Francesca? Is something wrong? No. No, oh, it's nothing, Nicholas. Did I say something I shouldn't? Oh, well, I mustn't interrupt. Goodbye, darling. Astonishing luck. Don't forget to call. The concert that night. The concert terrified me. Seeing Susan again reminded me of that day in school. My hands, how raw and clumsy they were. I wondered how I could possibly get through my final number. My hands, I 
could almost feel my fingers swelling as I play. Nicholas. Perhaps she's a little nervous, Mr. Brown. Ridiculous. She's been playing beautifully. She's crying. Look. Tears. Tears on her face. She must be ill. It's her final number. We'll forego the encore. But she must finish. She must be a success. She's fainted. Concert was a success. Dr. Larson, I, I can't account for my behavior. There was nothing wrong with my hands. And I had played well. Well, tell me, all this time you never saw Peter? No. I wrote him from Paris, but Letters came back marked, gone away. I didn't mind. I knew that one day I'd be back in London again. And I'd find Peter waiting for me. A few months later, I was giving a concert in Copenhagen. During the intermission, Nicholas opened the door for my dressing room. He always came in about now. I neglected to tell you at dinner, Francesca, that the cables come from London. They want you next month to Albert Hall. Do you want to go? Well, why ask me, Nicholas? You usually settle these things yourself. If I do, it's only to spare you the trouble. You know, you can do exactly as you please. Can I, Nicholas? I can refuse this offer, then? If you wish, certainly. No. No, I think I should like to go. I'll let them know you've accepted. That, that same night, after the concert, when Nicholas came for me, he knocked at my door. It was the first time I ever remembered him. It was a magnificent performance, Francesca. Now... If you're ready, we could, uh, have some supper at the Viking. If you like, Mr. We could go to the Rotunda, if you'd prefer. No. The Viking will be fine. Uh, Francesca, uh, you told me before I never consulted you on anything. <laughs> it doesn't matter. No, it does. If I haven't done so, it's only because I've wanted your life to be as smooth and easy as possible. Nicholas, but I'll let I... Let me finish. I've devoted years to converting a very ordinary girl in pigtails into a first-class artist. I've given up everything to help your career, and yet I make no demands on you at all. Yes, Nicholas. You're completely free to come and go as you please. Yes, Nicholas. That's understood, then? Good. Now, I've invited the Baron von Olbern to dine with us. He'll meet us at the Viking. Oh, yes. Uh, tomorrow after luncheon, there'll be a little reception at the Burgermaster's. I've told them you'll play one selection and no encores. Yes, Nicholas. We leave for London on Saturday. Come along, Francesca. We shouldn't keep the Baron with London. London again. Peter. Peter. Oh, stupid of me thinking that he'd be there. It wasn't even listed in the phone book. But I, I thought maybe he'd still be playing with that orchestra. But now I went from nightclub to nightclub. People seemed to know his name, but where he was, they couldn't say. It was late when I got into a taxi to go home. Then suddenly, the cab stopped for a traffic signal. And I, I looked out of the window. And there in front of the cafe was his picture. Here for a limited engagement. Peter Fulton and his orchestra. You found him then? You saw Peter that night? Yes. I don't want to talk about it. Well, you can tell me. No. No, I don't want to talk about it. Uh, will you tell me about Max, then? Max? Yes. Max will leave me. Max. Yes. Yes, we were still in London. Nicholas and I, 
I was standing outside the door of the study. To the point, Mr. Layton. In my opinion, you're the finest painter in London. I'd like you to paint a portrait of my ward. I'm flattered, Mr. Brandt, but I don't paint portraits anymore. Besides, I've never met your ward. That can be remedied. Certainly, but no portrait. It would interfere with my serious work. I'm, I'm greatly disappointed. I had my heart set on it. Good evening. Oh, Francesca. Uh, this is Maxwell Layton, my ward, Miss Cunningham. How do you do? How do you do? I have often heard you play, Miss Cunningham. You see, I have all your records. How kind of you. I was just suggesting that, Mr. Layton, uh, do your portrait, Francesca. Oh, but I... I don't care to have my portrait painted. Beg your pardon? Uh, why not? Well, it would interfere with my serious work, Mr. Layton. Good night. But uh, Maxwell Layton did paint your portrait. I'm sure I saw it reproduced in some magazine. Oh, yes. Yes, finally, after Max insisted, I let him sketch me while I practiced. His interest in me was, was very satisfying. Soon I, I discovered I'd become quite fond of him. Max, what was our bargain? That I could come here and sketch you so long as it didn't interfere with your work. But you'd much prefer if I sat for you properly, wouldn't you? Naturally. My head and arms all arranged in a striking pose. Yes. Under strict orders not to move a muscle unless you say so. Yes. Would you still like me to do that, Max? I would love you to do that. <laughs> well, then I will. Yes. Max gives the house day after day. One afternoon, I've, I've had posts for hours. Well, I think you can rest now, Francesca. Oh, thank you, Max. Would you like some tea? No, no tea. You'd much rather get back to your piano. I doubt if I'll ever be able to play again. My neck's so stiff I couldn't see the keyboard. It's a lovely neck, Francesca. Everything about you is lovely. Oh, I thought I was the ugly duckling in your gallery of beauty. No, you're not. You're... Well? Must you really know? Of course. You're the most beautiful woman I've ever painted. Not because you're beautiful, but because I'm in love with you. You shouldn't have said that, Max. It's the most natural thing in the world to say. I hate love. I hate being in love. I never want it to happen to me again. You might as well be dead. Then I'd rather be dead than go through it again. I thought I'd put a high wall of music around me, that I was safe, secure. And now you come along and knock it all down. I hate you for doing that. On the contrary, you love me. Maybe I do. I, I don't know. In any event, you won't have to pose anymore. The portrait's finished. Finished? Oh, Max, let me see. Oh, oh it's very good. Awful to think of Nicholas having it. Why? Well, it seems to look right through me. I, I don't want to think of Nicholas being able to do that. You're frightened of him, aren't you? Well, I know you'll think it's absurd, Max, but Nicholas has some extraordinary power over me. Then why do you stay with him? I don't know. I don't need to talk about it. What are you going to do now? Take a holiday? Italy, I suppose. I have an old tumble-down villa there. It's on a bay. Very quiet. Very restful. Mm. Sounds lovely. Will you paint? Francesca, must we keep on pretending? Come with me. I'm in love with you and you love me. I'm asking you to marry me. I, I'd be a poor wife, Max. I don't believe it. Let me risk that. I'd like to marry you, Max. Very much. <laughs> So, for the second time, Francesca, you went to Nicholas to tell him you were going to be married. Yes, Doctor. How can you even think of such a thing? I won't listen to another word. I don't care if you listen or not, Nicholas. I don't care what you say or do. Francesca. It's no use. I'm grateful to you for some of the things you've done for me. But I'll never forgive you for the others. I'm going away with Max next week. Now, please don't try to stop me or make me change my mind. Is that clear? Quite. I have nothing more to say. Bags are packed. You're leaving soon with him. Yes? I must talk to you. I don't want to talk to you. Francesca. Francesca, I... I haven't deserved this of you. I've given you everything I have. My love and my sympathy. My life hasn't been a happy one. 
you are the one beautiful thing that has come into it. Please, please listen, Francesca. Francesca, please stop playing. You're a great artist. You're my life's work, and now you want to throw it all away. Listen to me. You'll do as I say, and I demand you give this man up. Francesca, this happened once before, remember? You didn't love that boy, and you don't love Layton, and I'll tell you why. You belong to me. We must always be together. Promise. Promise you'll stay with me always. Promise me, Francesca. Nicholas, I'm leaving this house tonight. Very well. That's the way you want it very well. But if you won't play for me, you'll never play for anyone else. Ever again. <laughs> In my hands with his cane. Over and over he struck them until finally I found the strength to rush out of the house. Max had just driven up. I I got in his car and we drove for what seemed to be hours through the night. But one thought kept stabbing through my mind. I'm free of Nicholas. I'm free at last. Nothing can touch me again. Nothing. And then... And suddenly in the road, there was a man on a bicycle. They were going too fast. All Max could do was swing over into the... I... I woke up in this room. In this bed, Dr. Larson. I looked at my hands. They were bandaged. And I couldn't move them. I couldn't move my hands. I knew then I would never play again. Francesca, you're all right. You're going to be all right. Why didn't you kill me properly, Max? It was an accident, darling. Of course. But I'd rather be dead. What? Dr. Kendall says you'll be up in a day or two. Look at my hands. They've been burned, but only slightly. I don't believe you. Well, Francesca... Well, ask the nurses. Ask the doctor. I don't believe them either. They just want me to be quiet. But I know... I know I shall never be able to use my hands again. Francesca. No, don't touch me. Don't touch me. I wish I were dead. I wish I were dead. Pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. In a moment, we'll return with Act Three of The Seventh Veil. High school leading lady makes grade in Hollywood. That might headline the story of our young guest tonight, Miss Patricia Alphen, starlet at Universal International. Wasn't it that senior class play that put the uh, movie bee in your bonnet, Pat? Well, Mr. Keeley, it inspired me to come to Hollywood and look for a job. I got one as mail girl out at the studio. Mm, rather a humble beginning. Yes, but it was my good luck the second day there to deliver a letter to Walter Ranger. He arranged the screen test, and that got me my contract. Well, that was luck. And now you're really seeing how movies are made. Yes, indeed. And I've spent hours in the projection room watching new films. One of the most exciting I've seen, Mr. Keeley, is The Upturned Glass. Oh, yes. That's Universal International's next Sydney box release. With James Mason as star and co-producer. He plays a famous surgeon who destroys his career by committing a desperate murder. An unhappy hero, but a fascinating one in the true Mason style. Pamela Kellano, who is Mrs. Mason in real life, and Rosamond John give splendid performances also. It's Rosamond John who plays the romantic lead in The Upturned Glass. Yes, and she's so lovely to look at. Mr. Kennedy, you just ought to see that luxe complexion of hers in the close-up. Well, a luxe complexion spells glamour wherever you see it. Including, may I say... That of Miss Patricia Alphen. You're very kind, Mr. Kennedy. I do use Lux Toilet Soap faithfully. Screen stars are certainly right when they say it's a complexion care that works. 
It has to be the right care for million-dollar complexions when nine out of ten screen stars depend on it. I know that any girl who tries Lux Soap Facial for a while will be just as pleased as I am about what they can do for the skin. In other words, they'll know why Lux Toilet Soap is Hollywood's own complexion soap. Thank you, Miss Patricia Alvin, for that wise beauty counsel. I hope the ladies in our audience who want softer, smoother skin will follow your advice and get some fragrant white Lux Toilet Soap tomorrow. We return you now to William Keeley. Here are Joseph Cotton and Ida Lupino for Act Three of The Seventh Veil. Co-starred as Nicholas Brandt and Francesca Cunningham. It's a few minutes later. Dr. Larson, the psychiatrist, has left Francesca sleeping quietly. Apparently, he's learned all that he can from her. Now, in Dr. Kendall's office... The accident that brought her here in the first place, Dr. Kendall, the one in which her hands were burned. This happened a week ago? Yes. Somehow she got the idea she could never play the piano again. That accounts for her attempt at suicide yesterday. Uh, this Max Layden, where is he now? At the moment? I can't say. But he's here almost constantly. Mm. Well, there's nothing more I can do today. I'll be back in the morning. There'll be no injection tomorrow, Dr. Kendall. No narcosis. Oh, uh, you have a solarium here. I, well, yes, Doctor. <laughs> this may seem strange, but I'd like a piano brought in the solarium, a good piano, and a phonograph. See, Dr. Kendall, I have hopes that tomorrow morning Miss Cunningham will play again. <laughs> We're ready for you, Dr. Larson. Miss Cunningham's in the solarium, and the piano, and the photograph. Well, I don't mean to be mysterious, Kendall. Now, here is the history of Francesca Cunningham. As a child, the caning at school, resulting in her failure at the music examination, and the fear that her hands might be injured. The recent attempt by Nicholas Brand to smash her hands, again with a cane. Finally, the car crash, the shock of waking up in a hospital with her hands bent. All these things have built up a barrier? Yes. Which led her to attempt suicide and will continue to prevent her full recovery. And you intend to break down this barrier now? Well, I have hopes. I'll put her under hypnosis. Now with a phonograph, with the help of music which we know she loves, I'm going to suggest to her a way to break through this barrier. If I can make her play the piano, I shall wake her up while she's actually playing. Then she will know there is nothing really wrong with her hand. I've brought some records here by Miss Cunningham made a few years ago. I propose to play one of them in a few moments. Francesca, can you hear that music? It's beautiful, isn't it? She's hypnotized? Yes. She'll do exactly as I wish. Francesca, would you like to play this music yourself? The piano here. Play. I can't play. Yes, of course you can if you want to. Do you? Yes. Good. Now get up from that chair. Give me your arm. We'll walk over to the piano here. Ah, that's fine, Francesca. Yes. Now sit down. Put your hands on the keys. Your hands want to play. Try, Francesca. Try. Stop the phonograph, Kendall. She's playing. By George, she's playing. Under the hypnosis. Now to rouse her, to bring her out of it. Francesca, you are playing now of your own free will. Your hands are not injured. There is nothing wrong with your hands. You are playing. There is nothing wrong with your hands. She's opening her eyes, Doctor. She's... Uh, uh... Have you come here, Dr. Larson? Uh, Mr. Layden, because Dr. Kendall tells me you've removed Miss Cunningham from the sanitarium. Yes, she's here in my home. And I assure you, under adequate care. 
I feel it's my duty to go on treating her. I know what you did to her at the sanitarium this morning. I insisted that Dr. Kendall tell me. Even you must agree that she's suffered enough. She'll go on suffering till she's cured. Cured? With drugs? Hypnotism? Your kind of treatment is likely to unhinge her mind altogether. Does Nicholas Brandt know what's happened to Miss Cunningham? No, he does not. There's been nothing in the newspapers. As far as he knows, she and I are in Italy. How is she now? Very well, thank you. I see. Well, oh, Mr. Layton, please, this is all wrong. I can help Miss Cunningham. Would you object if I saw Mr. Brandt, if I asked his permission? Not at all. Legally, he's no longer her guardian. If he thinks he is, you might tell him that Francesca and I are to be married next week. Well, I assume she's agreed to marry you. I think you can assume that she will agree. Mr. Layton, that poor girl is in no condition to make up her mind on anything at the moment. I warn you, what you're doing is very dangerous. Good night, Dr. Larson. Good night, Mr. Layton. <laughs> I came directly here, Mr. Brown. What you've told me is a great shock. I... I thought Francesca was in Italy. I didn't come here to advise you of Francesca's condition or her whereabouts. It's quite possible she'd rather you didn't know. I came to ask a favor. What is it? I have a phonograph record here. It's a piece of music which has assumed some importance in this case. If you'd listen to it, perhaps you could tell me if it has any old sentimental association, any connection with someone she knew. There's a phonograph. Glad if you want to. Oh, well, thank you. Don't expect me to know anything about Miss Cunningham's private affairs, Dr. Lark. Well, it's always possible. Ah, you are familiar with the composition. I... Now, get out. You dropped your cane, Mr. Get Brad. out! You have helped me, after all. I've been aware of the power you've had over Miss Cunningham. But now I know why. Now I know what she means. Get out! I don't care if you are her nurse. I demand to see Miss Cunningham. I'm Nicholas Brandt. I'm her guardian. Well, if Mr. Layton were at home, sir... Where is Mr. Layton? Oh, he'll be back shortly. And if you'd care to wait... I'm going into that room. Oh, Francesca. I'm terribly sorry, Miss Cunningham. He just forced his way in. It's all right. Yes, Miss Cunningham. Francesca, whether you forgive me or not is of no consequence. I'm not stupid enough to, to expect forgiveness from anyone except myself. And I'd never forgive myself if I allowed you to go on like this. You know there's nothing the matter with you, don't you? You can be cured quite easily can play again if you want to. No, I... I don't know. I don't think so. Larson can cure you if you give him a chance. Layden doesn't want him to. He knows it would mean he'd lose you. No, I'll never play again. If you don't, it's your own fault. My fault? No use brooding over the past. It's your future you should be thinking about. <laughs> I have no future. Larson can give it back to you. He tried and he failed. Larson failed to work a miracle, so he's not to be given another chance. Is that it? Yes. Won't you let him try again? No. For me? No. Oh, Francesca, you... You are the, the most obstinate woman I've ever known. You... You remember the first time I asked you to play for me? You were as stubborn as a mule even then. I... I was frightened. <laughs> Am I such a frightening person? Yes. No. You're not frightened now. You're smiling. It's funny. It really is. It, it's so different when you're being kind. When you're like this, Nicholas, I, I think I'd do anything for you. All you've got to do is make up your mind. Lawson will do the rest. But I can't, Nicholas. I've tried. No. Look at me. I tell you, there's, there's nothing to be frightened of ever again. Nothing to be frightened of ever again? No. You really want to play, don't you? 
Oh, yes, I do, Nicholas. Then you will see Larson. Yes. Yes, I'll see Larson. Uh, I, I'll phone for him right away. The phone's just down the hall, Mr. Brandt. Laden. I, uh, I just returned. I overheard. It's all right. I'll phone Larson myself. Yes, of course I'll come, Mr. Layton. I'll be there late this afternoon. You can't come now? No, no, I have a little checking up to do. Incidentally, I'll see Miss Cunningham at her own home, uh, Mr. Brandt's home. That's ridiculous. You I may ins- drive her there any time you wish. Meantime, I'll be trying to track down a man by the name of Peter Fulton. <laughs> Very glad to meet you, Dr. Larson. But frankly, I can't imagine what you want to see me about. About a patient of mine, Mr. Fulton. Francesca Cunningham. Francesca? She's in great trouble. Let's see. The last time Miss Cunningham saw you, she hadn't seen you in years. By chance, she found you. Tell me, what happened that night, Mr. Fulton? Why, nothing. Nothing at all. Something must have happened. Oh, I I told her I was married, if that's what you mean. How did she take that bit of news? just walked out on me. She's like that, you know. Had she ever met your wife? No, not that I know of. We were divorced two years ago. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Fulton, as a tune, she seems to have associated with you, a waltz. I believe it was played in some Italian cafe. Oh, yes, yeah, sure. I, I even had my band recorded a few years ago. <laughs> I had some wild hope at the time that Francesca would hear it and well, it might help to bring her back to London. Do you have a copy of the record? I can get one. Would you bring it to this address, Mr. Fulton? That's Nicholas Brandt's address, isn't it? Yes. Can you be there at five o'clock? Why, yes, of course. But uh, why... Mr. Brandt will be there. Also a Mr. Layden. I won't detain you for long. I'll be there, though. Mr. Brandt, who is he? Who's that man upstairs with Francesca? You think Larson might have told me? His name is uh, Peter Fulton. What's he got to do with Francesca? He's a man she once wanted to marry. Why crack your knuckles, Mr. Layton? It won't help. What's that music? A tune that seems to have some meaning. Whiskey, Mr. Layton. Please. Parker. Whiskey for Mr. Layton, please. Yes, sir. Wait, wait. Here he comes. Well, Mr. Fulton? Well, what? Did anything happen? That's what I'm trying to figure out myself. Well, is she all right? What did Larson say? Well, I guess it all adds up to something, but Larson's way ahead of me. Oh, what's the good of turning the clock back anyway? It never did anyone any good. I wouldn't be too sure of that. Have a drink? Thanks. Make that two whiskeys, Parker. That music. That's Francesca, isn't it? Yes. What record is it? it? It's not a record. It's Francesca... She's always had a piano up there in her room. She plays beautifully, doesn't she, Jen? Dr. Larson. Yes, yes. That's Francesca. May I go up now, Doctor? It would be a pity to interrupt her. Doesn't she want me with her? Perhaps. What do you mean, perhaps? I mean, I think I can promise you a complete cure. Thank heaven. But you'll have to prepare yourselves for a new Francesca. A new and very different person. In what way? You see, the past is over for her now. It's quite over. Her mind is clear. The clouds have been swept away. She's no longer afraid. Well, whether you'll be entirely satisfied with the change in her, I don't know. It might be wise not to expect too much. Are you trying to tell me... I'm that... trying to tell you. She will want to be with one of you three men. One she loves. One she's been happiest with. The one she cannot do without. Or the one she trusts. And who is that? It would hardly be fair for me to say. She, she stopped playing. Yeah. Look. She's coming down the stairs. Nicholas. Oh, Nicholas. Nicholas. Mr. Fulton. Mr. Layden. Since you two gentlemen are leaving now, perhaps one of you will give me a lift home. Oh.
well-deserved applause for two superb performances from Joseph Cotton and Ida Lupino. And in answer to it, we bring them back to the footlights for a curtain call. Ida, you certainly lived up to the traditions of one of the oldest families in the theater, well, the Lupinos. Thank you. thank you, Bill. And I think Ignaz Hilsberg should have a vote of thanks for his wonderful piano contributions to our show tonight. I agree there, Ida. Incidentally, Bill, you didn't mention that The Seventh Veil won the Academy Award as the best original screenplay of the year. So it did. And speaking of screenplays, I wonder how many people in our audience know that you two are authors as well as actors. I understand you spent the summer over a typewriter, Ida. Well, that's right, Bill. I finished two screenplays, one of which is under option at a studio. Well, which would you rather do, Ida? Act or write? Well, I think I like both equally well. Well, for the sake of theater goers, I hope you never give up acting. Joe, you've written screenplays too, haven't you? <laughs> yes, that was my first contact with Hollywood, Bill. And before that? Well, before that, I used to write for radio. Dramatic shows? No, no. Uh, after theater interviews, the kind of thing where the producer says, now we bring our stars back for a curtain call and, and talks <laughs> about their private lives. <laughs> <laughs> mm, well, that, uh, it sounds rather familiar. Uh, did you have them say a kind word for uh, Lux Soap? Well, if I'd been on the show, I'd have insisted on it. I've used Lux Soap for years for my complexion and always will. And that lovely complexion is ample proof. <gasps> what sort of writing are you doing now, Joe? Well, I've been working on a play for several years, which still isn't finished. Well, sort of uh, all work and no play. Now, well, I've still got some filling in to do. Uh, how much filling in? Well, so far, I've just got the title completed and the acts numbered. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you mean. We won't count on it, then, for Lux. <laughs> what are you doing next on Lux, Bill? Uh, next Monday night, we bring our listeners one of the screen's greatest epics of the sea, starring in his original screen role, Alan Ladd. It's Paramount's version of Richard Henry Dana's famous novel, Two Years Before the Mass. Oh, Alan was great in that picture, Bill. Yes, and so was Howard De Silva, whom we also have co-starred with McDonald Carey and Wanda Hendricks in an action-packed tale of violence and mutiny on the high seas. Well, Bill, that place should fill the house. We'll be listening. Good night. Good night, night and all our thanks. <laughs> Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Alan Ladd Howard De Silva, MacDonald Carey, and Wanda Hendricks in Two Years Before the Mass. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. There's an appeal to housewives everywhere. Keep on saving and turning in your used kitchen fats. Thanks to patriotic American women, over 600 million pounds of used fats have been added to the United States' supply of industrial fats and oils since 1942. But all over the world, the supply is still critically short. Your government asks you to keep on with the magnificent job you have been doing so that not a pound of the essential fats and oils needed to make household necessities will be wasted. Remember, your butcher will pay you for every pound. So save and turn in your used kitchen fats. Joseph Cotton appeared by arrangement with David O. Selznick, producer of Intermezzo, starring Ingrid Bergman and Leslie Howard. Ida Lupino is currently starring in the Warner Brothers picture Deep Valley. Heard in our cast tonight were Joseph Kearns as Dr. Larson... Gail Gordon as Max, Jack Edwards Jr. as Peter, Bill Johnstone as Kendall, Francis Robinson as Susan, and Norman Field, Janet Scott, and June Whitley. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. And this is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear Two Years Before the Mast with Alan Ladd, Howard De Silva, McDonald Carey, and Wanda Hendricks. Fry. When you bake and fry. Fry. For your cake and pie. Fry. It's your shortening by Reliance Fry. For lighter, better tasting cakes, try Spry, the pure, bland, all vegetable shortening with the special cake making secret. Hear them say, boy, what a cook. Reliance Fry. F B R Y. Be sure to listen next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Two Years Before the Mast. With Alan Ladd, Howard De Silva, Donald Carey, and Wanda Hendricks. Stay tuned for My Friend Irma, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>